Uh, we're still waiting for. Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, hello, and welcome to the informational broadcast for the fiscal year 2022 for the notice of funding opportunity for the resident opportunity and self sufficiency service coordinator grant program, otherwise known as Ross. I'm Lewis Dorman, one of Ross's program managers, and I'm here with my colleague, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie, and I'm grateful to run the Ross program alongside Lewis. Thank you all for joining us today. Yes, thank you. And now we are going to begin the slideshow. One second, we're getting the slideshow loaded. And and here we go. So uh, today's agenda, uh, we're gonna be covering the application basics, program overview and purpose of the program, core functions of a Ross service coordinator, Changes from previous NOFOs, award information, eligible use of funds, eligible applicants, threshold requirements, and application requirements, assembling your application, and more. So we have a nice agenda. Let's get down to it. Um, for the FY 2022 Ross uh, NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunity, here are the basics. The deadline is July 18th, one minute before midnight Eastern Standard Time. And there's a total of $35 million of funding available for applicants. There are four types of eligible applicants. Public Housing Authorities, PHAs. Resident Associations, either locally incorporated nonprofit or 501c3 status. Tribes, Tribally Designated Housing Entities, TDHEs. And then, of course, 501c3 nonprofit organizations. But they must be supported by one of the above organizations. So here's the program overview of the Resident Opportunity and Self-Sufficiency Service Coordinator, ROSS, SC program. ROSS is a place-based program that targets the entire resident community and the projects served. The program should address the areas of needs at both the individual and community level. Ross service coordinators must work with residents, PHA staff, local partners, and other stakeholders to develop local strategies to address the needs of residents and remove barriers to self-sufficiency and as well as aging in place. The Ross Program Coordinator Program is designed to assist residents of public and Indian housing, PIH, make progress towards economic and housing self-sufficiency. The Ross Service Coordinator assesses resident needs and links them to supportive services and activities thus enabling residents to make progress towards economic self-sufficiency. The Ross Service Coordinator also links elderly disabled residents to services to assist them with aging or remaining in place. As of last year, um, it's new that Ross grantees may provide some direct services. That was for FY21 and it's the same for, for this year as well. We'll talk a little bit more later. About direct services. So the core functions of a Ross service coordinator, there's there's six here. First, everything begins with the resident needs assessment, 
This is where the, the service coordinator assesses the needs of a resident and you know begins to determine a plan for how best to meet them. Um, you know, then uh, service coordinators also building partnerships and coordination with, you know, whether it's inside the housing authority or the grant, you know, the grantee or, or external partners. Resident engagement, you know, reaching out to the residents in their community to to make sure that they understand about all the benefits of Ross and, um, you know, getting them to, to come and participate. You know, and then the, the, the more administrative side of case management, case management of, of, of their participants. Um, as we mentioned before, now Ross can use direct services, um, you know, contracting out to another provider to fill a gap where which they cannot do through their Ross services. Um, as well, and finally, evaluation, um, you know, evaluate evaluating the participants progress as well as the overall progress of the Ross grant. So there are several types of services for Ross coordinators to coordinate. These include child care services, adult basic education literacy classes, after school programming for K-12, high school GED programs, programs to assist with FAFSA completion for, for future college students, job training and skills, digital inclusion activities, credit counseling, financial literacy, health care coordination, assistance with activities of daily living for elderly and persons with disabilities. Congregate services, meal delivery services, employer linkage and job placement, nutrition courses, transportation, expunging, sealing or correcting criminal records or securing certificates of rehabilitation, substance use treatment, civil legal assistance, now we're going to talk about some changes from this year's NOFO 2022 and the previous one 2021, as well as uh, FY19, because FY19 Ross grantees, they will be eligible for renewal applications in this process. So there are some things that have changed since then as well. So brand new for this year, we have increased, or HUD has increased the salary for uh, Ross service coordinators. The new maximum is $75,000 per service coordinator. And this year, similar to FSS, Ross is not requiring salary comparability information. Instead, you will when you're filling out your application, you will use the, the Department of Labor's Bureau of Labor Statistics locality pay data. Plus, there's an additional 20 cent available for fringe benefits. You'll get a copy of these slides after the webinar, and you can follow the links here uh, to get to the Bureau of Labor Statistics page, but they'll also be in the NOFO too. So first, check the NOFO, you know, it's the guiding document and then, you know, but you can also look at the, the webinar slides. And then they will use the, the, the location to determine your salary, which will be the zip code for your agency. Um, and that and you'll use that into the BLS information. And then you can look at this section of the NOFO for further guidance. Um, now with the client to Ross service coordinator ratio, the service coordinator must provide general case management to residents, which include intake, assessment, education, and referral to service providers in the local community or subcontractors. HUD expects each Ross service coordinator to have a caseload of 50 Ross participants at any given time during the grant term except for new grantees who will have six months to reach 50 Ross participants. After that six months, they should have 50 participants. Also for this year, HUD removed the EDSC restriction, the Elderly Disabled Service Coordinator Program. So for FY22 applicants that receive EDSC funding, 
from the Public Housing Operation Fund, Operating Fund, you may now apply to serve elderly and disabled populations through the ROS program and not lose either EDSC or ROS funding. Um, so those were the three big changes from last year's NOFO. Now we'll talk about some changes that have taken place since 2019. For, this is mainly for renewal applicants. Um, so now the direct services and sub, subcontracting are permitted. Digital inclusion is an area of need. Um, for the letter of support for joint applicants, lead applicants must obtain a letter of support from each joint applicant they apply with. For the HUD 52-76A, you know, this is still, this is the primary application form and it is a required document that all applicants must complete and submit. It's now electronically fillable. And, you know, for this, when you put your, the salary comp information should come from BLS and we'll compare that um, with, with BLS data to see, make sure it's correct. A uh, rating criteria, uh, all applicants must submit a narrative addressing rating criteria. Applicants will be reviewed for past performance and capacity using a point system. Each applicant will need a minimum of 30 points to be eligible for funding. Uh, nonprofit status, all renewal applicants must certify that their nonprofit status is in good standing. The new, new applicants must submit a copy of their 2020 or 2021 annual return information. For the narrative requirement, all applicants need to have a narrative. Uh, previously, it was just new applicants. Uh, unexpended balance threshold, renewal applicants that have more than 60% of their FY19 funds remaining by the application deadline are ineligible for FY22 Ross funding. You need to have less than 60% you know, by July 18th, 2022, if you're applying for a renewal application. Uh, HUD reduced awards, HUD can, you know, reduce funding uh, as determined necessary by whole HUD sole discretion based on the applicant's need or capacity or prior performance. performance. The grant term is 36 months from the effective date of the grant agreement. Resident associations that are not based on site of the housing authority, they must include a letter of support from the PHA they intend to serve. The maximum number of Ross service coordinators per application is based on the number of occupied public housing and HASDA assisted rental units as of the application deadline and the developments you apply to serve. Mixed finance public housing units are eligible to be served. PHA affiliates or instrumentalities that are nonprofits are prohibited from applying for funds if the PHA they intend to serve would not be an eligible applicant. The opposite is also true. Um, a resident association is not, our definition does not include nationwide or nationally based resident associations. We're talking. And then the, there is a list of minimum qualifications for Ross service coordinators. All of this you can find in the note though. So uh, with the budget line of line items, salary, as we said before, is now $75,000 per year, with an increase from the previous year. And applicants can request up to $2,500 per service coordinator for training and travel costs. Administrative costs, for cannot be more than 10% of the combined salary and fringe of training and travel amounts per position. Reminders. You know, the 52768, this is the main form you're using for your application. And we'll check everything with BLS data. Uh, you know, the balance threshold for renewal applicants, you have to have spent down more than 60, um, more than 40% of your balance to be eligible by July 18th. 
Be sure to submit a narrative statement. Follow the NOFO for the for narrative guidance. And remember, there is the rating criteria for getting 30 points minimum to be eligible. The resident needs assessment. Um, this is required for all applicants to commit it to complete it. And you need to have at least 20% response rate of the of those living in the um, projects you intend to serve. There's an example in the NOFO uh, at the at the very end of the NOFO. Uh, non site, you know, as we mentioned before, non site based resident associations have to have that letter of support. Um, if if you're a tribe that's designated at high risk, they have to submit a narrative outline outlining corrective actions that have been put in place in response to special conditions that ONAP has, has put upon them. Award information. So the maximum number of awards, uh, the maximum amount of funding is $35 million. There might be some carryover from the previous year. HUD expects to make about 125 awards. Um, for P for grant for applicants that have 50 to 1,000 units, the maximum number of service coordinators is one. The maximum grant is 20, 255,750. For applicants that have 1,001 to 2,500 units, they can get two service coordinators with a maximum grant of $511,500. For applicants that have more than 2,501 units, they have three service coordinators with a max grant of $767,250. As we mentioned before, HUD may reduce the awards, the, reduce the amount of funding awarded at its sole discre discretion based upon applicants demonstrated financial need, capacity, and prior performance. Um, you know, this is the unexpected unexpended balance threshold. You know, if you if you have more than 60%, if you're a renewal applicant with more than 60% left of your balance as of July 18th, you're ineligible for FY22 application. And if you received Ross funding prior to FY19, you're ineligible for FY22 funding. As a new applicant, if you have expended, uh, if you have an unexpended balance of 40% or more of your pre FY19 Ross grant. Eligible use of funds. So you got your salary and fringe benefits. You can only use the BLI, I mean, you can only use salary and fringe um, in this BLI, and it has to come from the BLS data. Uh, training and travel, you know, it must, it must be for some kind of professional program development of the coordinators. And you need to get approval from your, your HUD field office before making these, these purchases. And you get $2,500 per year per coordinator. Administrative costs, these are only for supporting the Ross program, but you can use them for subcontracting for direct services or other fees to support needs of active Ross participants. Um, you do need to get pre-approval from your field office for this as well. And administrative, you get you know up to 10% of your salary fringe plus training and travel amount. Please remember to request only the amount you need. Salary comp information. Um, the awards will depend on the US Bureau of Labor Statistics for the community and social service specialist, all others occupation at the median level in your zip code. And here's the website. So when you go there, you know, you click on this link and you'll look for this in the box. You'll look for that occupation, enter that, and then put in your zip code. And then you'll, there'll be three different lines, you know, like the low, median, and, and high. And you're going to choose the information for the median level. And that's what you'll put um, into your application. 
Sometimes there won't, won't be any information for your zip code. In this case, you'll use the median regional for whatever your region is. Or it could be balance of state if there's no regional information. You know, for example, Utah. You'll use the Utah balance of state. But if there's neither of any of those informations, then you'll just use the US level median salary information for that occupation. Um, so the fund must be commensurate with that BLS data. And we'll consider everything commens commensurate if it is not higher than what's in BLS. You may also add up to 20% above the BLS level for fringe benefits, but that total amount can't be more than 75,000, you know, regardless of what it says in, in BLS. You got to use that salary finder on the BLS website to determine your the salary comparability information for your service coordinators. If that information is good for you and you don't need um, something different, then that's all you need to put on the 5276A. But if it's not enough, then you you can submit, you know, like previously, submit the three salary comps to justify why you want more. Um, please look at the NOFO for more information about how to do this. And and then, you know, of course, the service coordinator must have similar background and education qualifications per the NOFO. OK. So these are the steps for determining eligibility amounts for administrative costs. Um, step one, you've got your $75,000 max times three for three years, which is 225,000. Then you can add training, this training and travel, which is up to $2,500 per year per service coordinator. So this example is for one service coordinator. So you have $7,500 for that. And then with the administrative costs, you can take 10% of the total of those first two numbers and add it. So there you're going to get 22,350 for the administrative costs. And then you add that to the previous number where you get in step four, the 255,750, which is the max amount of award for one service coordinator. Here are some common administrative expenses. Staff support, lease rental of space, but no repairs or renovations. Local transportation, program outreach, furniture supplies, equipment, hardware, software. Um, but it has to be specific for, Ro for Ross, not for other programs. Uh, tracking evaluation property management software. Um, stipends for reasonable out-of-pocket out expenses for active Ross participants. Um, and there, these are also, here's some of the newer ones, adult basic education literacy, assistance with activities, child care, credit counseling, financial literacy, digital inclusion, fees to remove barriers, fees to support substance use treatment, um, incentives to encourage participation, health care coordination, job training skills. Um, and remember, one of the functions of the service coordinator is to build partnerships with local organizations to coordinate delivery of needed services. You must map, use or match your contributions. There's a lot of sources out there for match available. Please try to use them as much as possible. Um, you know, before you using grant money for direct services, you know, try to see if you can address that that gap with a local service provider with, via match. And you have to follow your organization's procurement policies and remember to get HUD approval before doing any subtract content contracting. So here's the eight areas of need education, health and wellness, reentry, employment, financial literacy, elderly disabled, substance use. Digital inclusion, which is new as of last year. Eligibility. 
Eligibility applicants are public housing authorities, PHAs, resident associations, which must be either locally incorporated nonprofit or 501c3 status. Tribes, tribally designated housing entities, TDHEs, as defined in section 422 of the HASDA. Indian tribes as defined in section 413 of the HASDA. And nonprofit organizations supported by any of the above organizations. Please note that PHA affiliates or their instrumentalities that are nonprofits are prohibited from applying for funds if the PHA they intend to serve would not be an eligible applicant. The reverse is also true. Uh, renewal applicants are applicants that were funded under the FY19 Ross NOFA. So your grant number should look something like this example with the first two numbers two zero. Um, there, there's going to be on the same place where we put this web um, webinar and the NOFO and all that information. There's going to be a list of all the FY19 grantees there that are eligible that, that may apply for renewal. New applicants. Um, that's somewhat an applicant that never received Ross funding or they had a previous award for FY19 in an unexpended balance of less than 40 percent. FY20 and 21 grantees are not considered new applicants, therefore ineligible for FY22 Ross funding. So now the Elderly Disabled Service Coordinator provision, EDSC. HUD removed it uh, from Ross program restrictions. So FY22 applicants that receive EDSC funding from the Public Housing Operating Fund may apply to serve elderly and disabled populations through the Ross program. And now uh, for threshold requirements, uh, Ross program manager Stephanie Adams will take over. Wonderful, thank you so thank much, you so Liz. Much, Liz. Um, uh, great. great, and if you can turn us to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So what is the threshold requirement? Threshold requirements are really critical. Um, these are requirements that must be met at the time of application. This means that if it's a threshold requirement, HUD cannot request clarifying information during the review period. Um, so if any threshold is not met or is missing from your application, we will not request that clarifying information and your application will be ineligible. Applications submitted after July 18th of this year that do not meet the requirements of the grace period will be marked late. Um, late applications are ineligible and will not be considered for funding. If your application is received by Grants.gov before the deadline but is rejected with errors, you will have a 24-hour grace period after the application deadline to submit a corrected, received, and validated application through Grants.gov. Match commitments are a statutory requirement for your um, FY22 application. All applications must have in place a firmly committed match contribution of at least 25% of the total grant amount requested. This match may be provided as cash or in-kind donation. Applicants must maintain letters from par all partners attesting to match contributions. Please refer to page 23 of the NOFO uh, for the match letter requirements and how to calculate the value of the match. Match amount is provided using that form 52768. And applicants should ensure that the areas of need the applicant is applying to address have firmly committed partners and match. So we want to see that connection between your match commitments and those areas of need that will guide your um, F you, well, that will guide your FY22 grant. If you're submitting more than one application, you must have separate match commitments. Letters of support for nonprofit applicants. If you are a nonprofit organization that is not a site based resident association, you must include a letter of support from either the PHA or tribe TDHE that you intend to serve. 
and please see page 25 of the NOFO for more information on that. Letters of support must include a signature by the authorized representative of the supporting organization, a date that falls between the publication date of this NOFO and the application deadline published in this NOFO, the number of eligible units at the PHA or those represented by a resident association, the project names and or project numbers where applicable of the projects to be served and the total number of units to be served, a description of to what extent the PHA or tribe TDAG is familiar with your nonprofit and an indication of their support. And also please include contact information in this uh, letter of support. Joint applicants also require a letter of support uh, from each. So lead applicants must obtain that letter of support from each joint applicant that they intend to serve. The letter must be dated between the NOFO publication date and the application due date. And here we'll refer you to page 28 of the NOFO um, for all the information that those letters must contain. Nonprofit status. Renewal applicants must certify that their nonprofit status is current and in good standing on the HUD 52768 form. The submission of the certification is one of those non curable threshold requirements. All new applicants must submit a copy of their 2020 or 2021 federal annual information return submitted to the IRS for 50C3 applicants or the state or tribal equivalent. If no annual return exists, the new applicant must submit other documentation that verifies the nonprofit status is active and in good standing. The submission of this documentation, but not the underlying nonprofit status, is a curable requirement. Contract Administrator. All resident associations and troubled PHA applicants must have a contract administrator. If the HUD 52755 is required and not submitted as part of an application, it will not be requested during the deficiency period and your application will be deemed ineligible. Narrative statements. Please note that this is a requirement for all applicants, both renewal and new. If the narrative statement is not submitted as part of the application, it will not be requested during the deficiency period. In addition to meeting the narrative statement requirements, all tribes designated as high risk must submit a detailed narrative that clearly addresses the corrective actions they have put in place in response to the area ONAP's findings. Unexpended threshold. Renewal applicants that have 60% or more of their FY19 Ross grant remaining by the application deadline will be considered ineligible for funding. We want to see that you're expending timely and expending during the time that we had anticipated at the time of your award. So that's why that requirement is really critical. New applicants with prior Ross grants, meaning uh, uh, Ross grants that preceded FY19, if those have 40% or more remaining in their grant, they will also be considered ineligible. 52768. This is the main Ross application form. Um, it is required, so if it is missing, your application will be ineligible. Any missing information from this form could render your application ineligible, so please read this form carefully and make sure that you have provided us all of the information that we request. One common mistake that we see is forgetting to include both property names and the number of occupied units in part two of the form, so please make sure you take a look at that closely and include both pieces of that information. Civil Rights Matters. 
All outstanding civil rights matters must be resolved by the application deadline. Applicants who after review are confirmed to have unresolved civil rights matters by the application deadline will be deemed ineligible. Some additional NOFO requirements. Areas of need. Um, so remember that we list these areas of need in the NOFO and we ask that you select three areas of need to be addressed. If an applicant selects digital inclusion, health and wellness, reentry, or substance abuse, the applicant must also select either education, employment, or financial literacy. Each area of need must be supported by the resident needs assessment, and I'll add that you'll remember from our match, um, our match slide that those match commitments must also be tied to your areas of need. So let's talk about the resident needs assessment. All applicants must complete a resident needs assessment for the projects included in their FY22 Ross application. It can be from within the past three years. Applicants are not required, although encouraged, to use the sample community needs assessment. You can find this in Appendix B. And if you don't use Appendix B, you um, have to submit the needs assessment tool that you used instead. There must be at least a 20% response rate at the households that reside in projects included in the application. We want to make sure that we have an appropriate sample size so that you can really make good informed decisions about applicable areas of need. All applicants must identify the needs of residents that the Ross Service Coordinator will address on the HUD 52768 form. So let's speak on the number of positions for tribes and PHAs. PHAs, tribes slash TDHEs, and 501c3 nonprofits applying on their behalf may apply for up to three Ross service coordinators, depending on the number of occupied ACC or NAHASDA assisted units as of the application deadline and properties to be served by the Ross service coordinator. We've included here the numbers that you can also find in the NOFO. For the first 50 to 1,000 occupied units, you can potentially qualify for one Ross service coordinator. 1,001 to 2,500 occupied units could potentially qualify you for two Ross service coordinators. And any number of occupied units that exceeds 2,501, um, equal to or exceeds 2,501, can mean three Ross service coordinators. Please note that each application must have at least 50 occupied public housing units to be eligible. Site-based resident associations. These entities may apply for one Ross service coordinator for the project that they represent. Site-based resident associations may apply jointly if necessary to add up to at least 50 units. Only three site-based resident associations from any one public housing authority may be funded for new and or renewal. Non-site-based resident associations. If availing themselves of the 25% set aside, they are looking to see that one service coordinator. And if they are not availing themselves of the 25% set aside, they can see up to nine service coordinators for three different public housing authorities. Please note that contract administrator partnership agreements are required of all resident associations. Nonprofits. So nonprofits may apply for up to nine service coordinator positions, renewal and or new. Up, that means up to three applications, bear in mind three coordinators per PHA, tribe or TDHE. Um, a letter of support and other information is required from every PHA, 
tribe or and or TDHE that a nonprofit intends to serve. Three is the raw service coordinator position limits. HUD will fund a maximum of three raw service coordinator positions to a PHA or tribe TDHE uh, depending on the occupied unit count as of the application deadline. For example, if a PHE, PHA has three site-based resident associations that apply and the PHA is eligible for and applies for three positions as well, only three positions will be funded in total. If more than one application proposing to serve the same projects is received, they will each be reviewed, and if each is deemed eligible, the application with the highest score will be funded. If there's a tie, a lottery will be held. Renewal applicants. These applicants may apply to serve the same projects, entirely different projects, or a mix. They may change uh, the requested budget, number of service coordinators, population to be served, so that work able or elderly and disabled, their funding request, etc. PHA slash TDHE slash nonprofit applicants, if the number of ACC or NAHASDA rental units has changed, you may be eligible for more service coordinator positions or less depending on the occupied unit count. So remember the occupied unit count is really critical in determining how many service coordinators might be eligible. Renewal PHA and resident association applicants may not also submit applications under the new category. Funding restrictions. Let's speak on eligible participants. All program participants must be public housing residents or NAHASDA assisted rental housing residents. To the extent that other residents, for example, Section 8, may live at an assisted project, as may be the case in a mixed finance public housing project, only the public housing or NAHASDA assisted residents may be served by the Ross Service Coordinator. Section 8 residents are not eligible to be served by this grant. Please note, community events such as job fairs or health fairs can be open to non-public housing residents. Ineligible activities. So these are listing some ineligible costs. That would include the salary of the FSS coordinator, so no Ross grant funds, they can, Ross grant funds cannot be used to pay any part of the, sal the salary of an FSS coordinator. Um, also ineligible are costs associated with preparing your application. Funds awarded for the Ross program can only be used for the Ross program. Grantees may not pay the Ross service coordinator less than the salary fringe amount granted by HUD. So the amount that you request is the amount that we ask you to pay your service coordinator. Work and expenses outside the scope and intent of the Ross program. Uh, please note that the above list is not exhaustive. RAD, also known as Rental Assistant Demonstration. Applicants may not apply to serve properties that have converted through RAD or properties that have received a RAD commitment to enter into a housing assistant payment, also known as TRAP, as of the deadline date of this NOFO. Narrative information and review criteria for renewal applicants. So here we'll give you a glimpse into the application and scoring process for those renewal applicants, starting with rating factor one. Renewal applicants will be scored and ranked based on the total number of points that they earn for each of the rating factors. Rating factor one looks at past performance. It has a maximum of 25 points available. 
It is uh, based on annual reporting and timely use of funds. Please note that there's no narrative required for this past performance rating factor one piece. Um, capacity to meet program requirements. This is up to 15 points. Here we look at the achievement of serving residents, uh, which carries up to 10 points. The score depends on the number of Ross service coordinator positions and the number of residents served. And HUD will get this information by reviewing applicants annual reports to determine the number of residents they served during the grant term. Applicants that have not served at least 25 residents, um, really we're asking for at least 50 residents for each year, um, but at least 25 residents will receive zero points on this criterion. HUD will use personal identifiers, one of the required data elements submitted with the annual performance report data to calculate the number of residents served. And the second piece of the capacity part of rating factor one is submission of annual reports. Here you can receive up to five points. Please note that annual reports are due October 30th of each year. Applicants that have not submitted their reports by the due dates will receive zero points. Here you can see um, the number of points that you could receive for based on the number of residents that you've served. Um, so as you can tell, 50 serving 50 residents per service coordinator per year will get you those full points. That's what we expect and that's that's what we ask for you um, for your service coordinators to reach. If your service coordinator serves that 25 to 49, um, then they'll receive your application will receive partial points. You can get five points for that and anything below that 25 number, the, the 25 residents per service coordinator per year, anything below that would get you zero points. Great, so a little more detail on timely use of funds. Renewal applicants will receive up to 10 points based on timely expenditure of FY19 Ross Service Coordinator grant funds. You can see in this table um, that those who have expended 50 to 59.9% of their FY19 funds, uh, excuse me, that have 50 to 59.9% unexpended, FY19 Ross funds would receive zero points um, due to that high unexpended balance. And likewise, um, you can see that you can receive partial points if you have slightly lower unexpended funds. And then all of those who have 39.99% or less um, in terms of unexpended FY19 Ross service coordinator funds those applicants would receive the full 10 points. Past performance. If your FY19 Ross grant received additional conditions on the award or a grant suspension, it will result in a 10 point reduction from your score. Rating factor two for renewal applicants. Here we look at soundness of approach um, and this is where that renewal narrative comes into play. There's a maximum of 20 points that you can receive. And based on our, our reviews and what we're looking for, we, we share with you here a few tips. So please limit the narrative to five pages. We expect it to be double spaced with one inch margins and 12 point Times New Roman font. Text over the five page limit will not be read. Be clear and answer the questions in the order that they are asked in the NOFO. Some applicants that we see might even include the question and an answer. Um, that's perfectly acceptable. We just want to clearly tie your answers and your responses to the questions that we're asking. The areas of need addressed must be those identified on the HUD 52768, so we will review to make sure that those match. Do not provide extraneous information. In the past, we found identical narratives across several applications. 
Applications with narratives that are found to be repetitive of other applicants' narratives may not be considered or evaluated. Fewer points will be awarded for lack of detail. So more on those narratives in rating factor two, soundness of approach for renewal applicants. Those narratives must include a few items. We need to see the project names where residents were surveyed in the community needs assessment, the number of respondents and the response rate, total number of households, analysis of results. You're welcome to um, show us the analysis in a chart. How you and or your partners will address each selected area of need. Please include details on programming and or partnership agreements. We want to see a description of your capacity and your partner's capacity, the capacity and experience of existing or proposed staff, description of how the staffing at your agency, including your organization's leadership, will support the Ross program. High risk designation for tribe must submit a detailed narrative that addresses the corrective actions that have been put in place in response to ONAP findings. Let's speak on new applicants now. Rating factor one for new applicants. New applicants will be scored and ranked based on the total number of points allocated for each of the rating factors. Both rating factors for new applicants are narratives. There is a 10 page limit and you're welcome to reference the NOFO pages 40, 54, excuse me, 54 through 55 to learn more about the rating factors for new applicants. Rating factor one with a maximum of 25 points looks at capacity. We ask for a description of your experience with and capacity to manage multi-year grants that served public housing, Native Americans, and or low-income residents within the past five years. We ask that you provide the grant name, grant year, source of funds, and grant amount. You can receive up to five points on this metric. We ask you to describe the experience and achievements with providing supportive services to public housing, Native Americans, and or low-income residents within the past five years. Uh, we need to see a description of the needs that your programs were designed to meet and the outcomes, again, up to five points. We need examples of partnerships created with relevant entities and the services or contributions they made to ensure supportive services were provided. Uh, we ask for a description of staff experiences with case management tracking at the individual client level and reporting on client progress related to supportive service programs over the past five years. And we also ask for a description of how your agency has recruited and retained residents in your supportive service programs. Each of these carry up to five points. Rating factor two for new applicants explores soundness of approach. There's 20 points maximum um, that you can receive in this section. So here we want to hear about the results of your needs assessment and how you will address the areas of need. The areas of need, again, must be those identified on the HUD 527768. The narratives must include project names where residents were surveyed, number of residents and the response rate, number of households in each project to be served, analysis of results, and again, you can use a chart for this, how you and or your partners will address each selected area of need, including detailing on the programming, the partnership agreements, how will staffing at your agency support the Ross program, how will you track progress and submit annual reports, and what is the capacity and experience of existing or proposed staff? Remember these tips, be clear and be concise. We really want to hear exactly your answers to the questions that we provide and extraneous information is not helpful for your application. It may um, be a best practice to have someone else read your narrative before submitting. 
Answer questions in the order found in the NOFO. This will help us to clearly align your answers with the questions that we ask. Points may be deducted for lack of detail. Preference points for opportunity zones. Please note that HUD will not award preference points for those qualified activities supporting opportunity zones. So here you can see the minimum and maximum scores for eligibility. The minimum number of points um, that you need in order to be eligible for funding, potentially eligible, would be 30 points. And the maximum number of points that's possible to obtain through the application scoring is 45 points. Funding priorities. Applications that meet all NOFO requirements will be rated and ranked through the process that we've just covered. Applicants that earn less than 30 points are not eligible for funding. Funding category one is a 25% set aside for resident association applicants. HUD will fund this category in ranked order, starting with the highest review score. If more than one applicant shares the same score and there is not enough for funding to award them, HUD will conduct a lottery. Resident associations not funded in the set aside will be placed in the appropriate renewal or new funding category. Funding category two is renewal applicants. HUD will fund this category in ranked order, starting with the highest review score. If more than one applicant shares the same score and there is not enough funding to award them, HUD will conduct a lottery. Renewal applicants may be subject to a reduced award. And funding category three is our new applicants. So again, HUD will fund this category in ranked orders, starting with the highest review score. If more than one applicant shares the same score and there is not enough funding to award them, again, HUD will conduct a lottery. Accessing application. You'll need to go to navigate to grants.gov or view opportunity grants.gov in order to access the application. You'll click on the search grants tab, which uh, we have this red arrow here pointing to that tab. And the easiest way to locate the application is by CFDA uh, number 14.870. How to access the application. So first you can enter that CFDA number here and search those grants. You'll click on the URL that appears. Um, next, you'll be brought to this page. You'll see the tab package. Select that tab. And then you can click on preview or apply. There, and please note that there are three parts here on this screen. Mandatory on the far left, optional to the right of it, and instructions download just above. So let's talk about those forms that are under the mandatory tab. Uh, here you'll find the application for federal assistance, which is the SF424, our budget form. There is the HUD Applicant Recipient Disclosure Report, HUD 2880, and the Ross Application Form, HUD 52768. Completing the HUD 2880, this is the Applicant Disclosure Report um, application download. So these are some tips to help you answer those questions. For question one, um, are you applying for assistance for a specific project or activity? You'll answer yes. And uh, for question two, 
Have you received or do you expect to receive assistance within the jurisdiction of HUD involving this project or activity in this application in excess of $200,000 during this fiscal year, October 1st through September 30th? Your answer here should only be yes if you are requesting more than $200,000 for this grant for the first year. This means for many of you, the answer will be no. And please note this question in part one, threshold determination applies only to this grant application. If you answer yes to both, you must fill out parts two or three. Most of you that need to enter anything in parts two or three will enter not applicable. Let's discuss the forms under that optional tab. So here you'll see a grants.gov lobbying form. This is a one page form that asks you to certify that no funds will be used for lobbying. If you will be using funds to lobby, you must fill out SFLLL. Disclosure of lobbying activities, that's the SFLLL, only need to fill that out if applicable. Assurances of non-construction programs, this is the SF424B. This is required but curable. And lastly, assurance for construction programs, that's SF424D, and this form is not required, not necessary. Now remember, above the optional tab, there was the instructions download. Um, so this screen shows you some of those forms that you can see there. Um, and you might create a folder to save all these files. You could name it FY22 Ross Instructions Download uh, to make it easy for everyone to understand what, what might be included. putting together your application. So remember, those mandatory forms are very important, plus the Ross program specific forms. Ross program specific forms and documents would include HUD 52752, that's the Certification of Consistency with Indian Housing Plan, it's a curable requirement, HUD 52753, Certification of Election of Resident Council Board, HUD 52755, Contract Administrator Partnership Agreement, this is not curable, and HUD 52768, that's the primary application form, it's funding request form, and this is also not curable. So we encourage you to make a checklist to keep track of all the forms that you'll need to submit along with your application. Under the Ross program specific forms, there's also the letter of support for nonprofits applying on behalf of a PHA tribe or resident association, um, letter of support for joint applicants, uh, from joint applicants demonstrating support of their lead applicant, narrative, and that narrative for tribes designated as high risk. All of these Ross program specific forms listed here, all are non-curable. Resident needs assessment and appendix B, uh, that's where we have the sample resident needs assessment that you're welcome to use. Uh, we need to see if you're not using appendix B, please attach that assessment tool that you've used instead. We need evidence of 501c3 status and 2020 or 2021 information return for new applicants. This is a curable requirement. And one last item is that code of contact. Uh, so we've included the URL that you're welcome to view to see more. If there are no changes, no action is needed. Form 52768, so this is the, the meat of your Ross application form. Um, and we also refer to it as the Ross funding form. So this screenshot here shows you what part one looks like. This is general information. 
And part two is uh, the salary request. And we asked for the units. Um, so here's where you tell us the projects to be served. It's great if you can tell us both project number and project name under the projects to be served box. Um, and then to the right, you'll put your request for salary fringe, admin, and training for each service coordinator that will be serving those properties. And at step, step opening, opening, um, please, please note, note the note at the bottom. bottom that's that's correct. correct. As, we, As mentioned, we mentioned, this doesn't apply to that. This is an old screen. This is a screenshot from the previous year. So that this note does not apply for the 2022 notebook. Thank you so much for that, Lewis. Yeah, that's that's a great thing to highlight. And one other part that I'll note is that the number of units to be served. Uh, please keep in mind that this is occupied units um, and we look at the occupied units at the time of the application deadline. So that's what we're looking for in the number of units box. Thank you, Lewis, for, ch for sharing no. that. Thank you, Stephanie. Great. So part three looks at salary comparability. And as Lewis shared earlier, um, we're using BLS um, for this year, for this NOFO. Uh, so here you'll enter BLS salary data in the first section. And part form, this is the match portion of the form. Uh, so we'll need to see the need of residents. Remember that the match is supposed to tie to those areas of need the service to be provided, source of match. Um, so here you'll list the source of match, meaning uh, who is providing this match, and then the value of the match. You can see here that um, we have all of the different attachments that might be included. Um, this is that attachments form screenshot. Important application reminders. You must renew your Systems for Award Management, SAM, registration annually. So registrations in SAM are active for only one year. Um, so make sure that that is active when you're submitting your application. The SAM registrant is notified by email 60, 30, and 15 days prior to the registration. So please check your inbox and keep up on, on that um, expiration. Please go to www.sam.gov for more information. And if you're having problems with your SAM, uh, we've included the Federal Service Desk phone number here, and you're welcome to give them a call. And please bear in mind that there is no cost to register or renew your SAM. Some important reminders about registration. If you changed your e-business point of contact in the SAM registration, make sure that the new e-business point of contact has also granted permission to the person submitting the application to be the Authorized Organizational Representative, or AOR. DUNS is no longer required. For those of you who've submitted in the past, you'll be familiar with DUNS, but now instead we use Unique Entity Identity Number or UEI. For UEI information, please see the slides at the end of the presentation for first time registration. You are submitting your application through Workspace on grants.gov. And uh, we've included at the bottom a few resources. We have a good overview for the registration process, as well as a series of videos and guides from grants.gov that might help you as you navigate the application. Some application tips. We advise that you read the FY22 NOFO carefully and thoroughly. This will make sure that mistakes are not made. We encourage you to create a checklist, um, mark down all those forms that you'll need to submit with your application. Every year we see avoidable mistakes which are made and lead to ineligible applications. So um, please read that thoroughly and we'd love to um, we'd love to avoid that common mistake. Start your application now and review your application prior to submission. 
Like we said with the narrative statement, it may help to have a second set of eyes look over what you've written as well as your application forms. Some other useful links. Uh, we have the hud.gov slash grants page, which includes some really helpful information about the registration process, grants management, grants regulations, policies, and funding opportunities. Of course, the Ross NDOFO, strongly encourage you to familiarize with that. Um, you can get the following um, from the above link, you'll see the Ross NOFO, FAQs, previously awarded list, a recording of this webcast, and other information. Please remember, uh, you will have to submit your application through grants.gov's workspace, um, and we have some informational and tutorial videos that you're welcome to view if you follow that listed link. And then the applicant FAQs, again, are listed at that URL um, posted here. Contact information. So you're welcome to reach out to ross-pah at hud.gov. Uh, you'll reach myself and Lewis. If you have um, questions or concerns, you're welcome to reach us there. To join the Ross mailing list, uh, please follow this URL. We would love to have you included on the mailing list. That way you'll get notifications when we have resources, webinars that may be coming out. If you want to learn more about Ross, we encourage you to check out our HUD.gov page um, at this URL where you can learn more about the program. And lastly, the Ross HUD Exchange page is really resource rich. We have a wonderful guides, um, tools, resources that might help you learn more about the program and prepare to uh, navigate it if you're applying for the first time or as a renewal. Great, and we really appreciate your participation. Um, we're grateful that you're interested in the RAS program. <laughs> and best of luck to you. We truly hope that um, we wish you the best as you navigate these applications and we're excited to review them um, and excited to welcome our FY22 cohort once that time comes. Thank you, Stephanie. And now we have a little PS with some uh, first time registration information for applicants. Um, so, you know, remember these slides are a courtesy uh, for, for all folks interested, all applicants interested in the Ross program. Um, you know, for complete information, look at grants.gov, look at the NOFO, um, and then, you know, look at the slides as, you know, something tangential, you know, as, as an ex not an accessory, but, you know, something, something to support those. Those are the main documents. And as Stephanie mentioned, we are no longer using guns. And that's not just Ross, that's everywhere in the in the United States. Um, now they have the, the unique entity ID, the UEI. Uh, here's the link where you can obtain one if you don't already have it. So you, similarly as before, you know, register with the SAM.gov website to designate the eBiz point of contact. You know, make sure whoever's going to be your AOR, their up-to-date contact information is there so that if you're awarded a grant, you know, everything will go directly to them and you won't have any problems accepting the award or, or anything like that. And when you're creating or updating your profile at SAM, you know, uh, you'll have to use this nine digit profile number, marketing partner ID number, MPM. Um, remember it's, it's mandatory for SAM registrants and um, nine characters, one must be upper or lower case, and one a number. No spaces or special characters permitted. It's a personal code that allows you to access other government applications, such as the PATH Performance Information Retrieval System, the PPARS. Um, the MPIN acts as your password in these and other federal systems, and you should safeguard it. The person who submits the application through grants.gov is the applicant's authorized organization representative, the AOR. Um, they're the one that you know has to register with the grants.gov. 
and they're the ones that you know if you get the award we'll we'll, we'll sign to accept it they'll receive an email so it, like i said it's important to have their correct com contact information with this account um and then you know they'll use the the ubi and mpn to confirm that the aor is authorized and then they'll get an email from grants.com grants.gov sorry informing that they've been approved uh, an organization may have more than one aor but the aor should not wait for email it should log in and check the status of registration and the status should be authorized everybody involved in this process should add at grants.gov, at sam.gov, and at fsd.gov to their safe senders list and their email program, you know, so that nothing will, so none of these important emails will go to your spam, you know, or just check your spam from time to time, spam folder. And if you haven't registered yet, go ahead and start your registration process immediately. Um, if, if your previous AOR, AOR left, you know, follow the registration processes to get a new one registered and authorized. You don't want any of these things slowing down your application. In the past, incomplete registration has happened pretty often, and it results in applicants not getting funding. You know, so don't rely on automatic email no notifications. You know, log in there and to, to check the success at each step of the registration process. There's plenty of, uh, you know, videos available to guide you through the process. So check out grants.gov and be sure to select registering as an organization applicant. If you've changed your e-business point of contact in the same registration, make sure the new e-business point of contact has also granted permission to the person submitting the application to be the authorized organizational representative AOR. And that's it from us. Um, you know, thank you, everybody. And, you know, we hope that plenty of you are applying for renewals and, and new applications for, for Ross. And, you know, we hope to, you know, work with you more in the future. Stephanie. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate uh, having you listen in.